each and every one of you. From a human perspective, it's hard to look at the world today and not feel a sense of pessimism about the future of the human race. But thank God we have the Bible which tells us the true destiny and future of humanity. Worldwide media enables us to see the extent of contemporary evil and escalating international and national and local problems. It looks very dark out there in the world on both an international, national, local and personal scale. We see war, racism, tribalism, social conflict, crime, economic problems such as a widening gap between the haves and the have-nots between the rich and the poor. We see dishonesty, corruption, injustice, sexual promiscuity, disintegrating families. Why in the history of the world have we never, as a human race, been able to create a truly fair and equal society that benefits all? Why have we not been able to create such societies with social equality, with civil equality, with political equality, with economic equality and with legal equality? And my goodness, people have tried in history and people have dreamt up the perfect state. The ancient Greek philosopher Plato described a perfect society as one where everyone lived harmoniously and without the fear of violence or material possession. He believed that political life in Athens was too rowdy and that no one would be able to live a good life with that kind of democracy where people were shouting and screaming at each other across democratic platforms. A bit like today, isn't it? He believed that the perfect state would contain four qualities of wisdom, courage, self-discipline and justice. I don't think it was a perfect society that he had in mind because he would say that wisdom would come from the ruler's knowledge and making wise decisions, that there would be a ruling class and that courage would be demonstrated by the citizens who would defend the land and selflessly help the rulers to govern. It sounds like an unequal society to me, not a perfect society, but that is not the point. The point is that even though he had what he thought was the vision for a perfect society, he admitted that with his vision there was something corrupt in human nature that would ruin such a society if it was to come about. Mankind is incapable of running our own affairs. It's not possible to create a just, free, humane, peaceful society because people ruin it. And Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 10, which is our text today, it has a lot to say about human nature and it's very pessimistic about it when a person lives without God. But it's very optimistic about what God has done and is doing through Jesus Christ. So let's read Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 10. And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
Last time we considered the Apostle Paul's prayer for the church at Ephesus, for the Christians. And we looked at how to pray like an apostle. And that he was praying without ceasing for them. That they would have their inward eyes enlightened by the Holy Spirit. And every Christian needs to have their eyes enlightened by the Holy Spirit, their inner eyes. So that they would know the implication of God's call to them. That they would know the wealth of the eternal inheritance waiting for them. And that they would know the surpassing greatness of the power that was at work in them. It was a power that God had demonstrated with an historical demonstration when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead and exalted him. He exalted him over all the spiritual powers of evil and also the dominion of men. And Paul reminds the Ephesian Christians how God's power had affected their lives. They had experienced the miracle of the new birth. Their hearts had been regenerated. They had come alive to God. They had been born again. They could fellowship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Because that resurrecting power had brought them to life in Christ. And it had made a change and a difference in their lives. So he reminds them that Christ was physically dead, but God had raised and exalted him. He reminds them that they were once spiritually dead, but God had raised them and exalted them in Christ. He exalts the Christian with Christ. That is something that God does through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he delivers us from the bondage of death and evil. So the Apostle Paul writes that before they knew Christ, he says they were dead, they were enslaved, and they were condemned. The Apostle Paul is clear about the devastating condition of a human being without Jesus Christ. It's a description of everybody, of the whole human race. Every fallen man, fallen woman in every society throughout history and we have all contributed in small and large ways to the work of evil in this world. For instance, if you've told a lie, you've distorted the truth. And we could use many different examples. Romans chapter 3 verses 23 and 24 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So look at verse 1 of Ephesians chapter 2. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. They were dead. This is not a metaphor. Yes, they were physically alive. But it was a factual statement of everybody's spiritual condition outside of Jesus Christ. A trespass, and the Greek word is paraptoma. It's a wrong step. It's a crossing a known boundary or deviating from the right path. A sin, the Greek word, is homishia. It means missing the mark, like an arrow fired, which falls short, or it's a falling short of a standard. And the Bible says that we of all, as human beings, fallen short of God's standard. We have all trespassed, and we have all sinned. They cover sins of omission, the things we have not done which we should have done, and the sins of commission, the things we have done that we should not have done. According to Jesus and the Apostles, in our natural human states, we are rebels and failures before God. We have missed the mark. We have not lived up according to his standards. And as a result, we are dead and alienated from the life which God has for us. Eternal life is fellowship with our Creator. Spiritual death is his separation from him. People who do not know God are blind to the glory of Jesus Christ. They're deaf to the voice of the Holy Spirit. They have no love for God, no sense of his presence, no desire for his word, no interest in fellowshipping with his people. They are unresponsive to God as a corpse is. 
Because Paul says they are spiritually dead, dead in trespasses and sins. But he's talking to the Christians. He says, but God made you alive. He caused them to become spiritually alive, born again through Jesus Christ. And in verse 2, he says, In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So as well as being spiritually dead, the Apostle Paul says they were enslaved. They were enslaved to forces over which they had no control. You see, behind death lies sin. And what lies behind sin? Three sources of enslavement, we are told here. The world, the devil, and the passions of our flesh. He says about walking, following the course of this world. People drift along in the life on the stream of the world's idea of living. People seek fame, wealth, and happiness. But Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he said, all provision will be given to you. And so people follow the course of this world, which is in hostility towards God. That is why we see so much chaos, corruption, and death, and sin all across the world, locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. We see the world, the human race, in chaos, because they're following the system of this world. They are trespassing and falling short, going in the wrong direction, and falling short of the standard, sinning which God has set for humanity. The devil here is called the prince of the power of the air. He says they're enslaved to the prince of the power of the air. The word air means the unseen world, where these malign forces of evil operate. Yes, there is a, a being called the devil, called Satan, and a third of the angels, the Bible tells us, fell at an early point in creation and rebelled against God. And these become the principalities, the demonic powers who work in the unseen world. This is where they operate. It's an interesting fact that whilst Satanism is flourishing outside of Christian churches, it's becoming increasingly unfashionable in churches to believe in a personal devil or demonic intelligences. Yet Jesus and the apostles knew the truth about such beings and they warned us about them. Satanism and devil worship is on the rise in Britain. This is according to the census data released by the Office for National Statistics. The 2021 census carried out once every 10 years includes a voluntary question on religion. And the number of people identifying as Satanists increased by 167% between 2011 and 2021 in England and Wales. The highest number of Satanists are in the South East, rising by 165% according to the census of a few years ago. There are legally recognised churches of Satan, and Satanists venerate what Christians call the principle of of evil. They venerate the devil, pray for his assistance and perform elaborate rites in his honour. As stories have emerged over the past few years of Satanists being believed to have taken part in alleged animal sacrifices near churches. I've experienced this myself many years ago when I was a pastor of a church up in Northamptonshire. I was asleep in my bed one night and I suddenly had this horrific nightmare. And it felt so real. It was like these demonic dogs and beasts were outside the mounts, the church house I lived in, and they were trying to, to break in, and they were had such evil and vicious snarls on their, their faces. And yet I was protected. Every time they came against the house, an invisible wall just caused them to, to bounce off. 
I woke up in a cold sweat. It was very vivid, that dream. The following morning, I went up to the church and over the church doors, there were some symbols, satanic symbols painted on the, on the church building and there was blood on the church steps where somebody had been performing some sort of rite and of course it didn't take me any time at all to equate the dream I had had that night with what had obviously taken place on the church steps on the same night. I won't tell you what happened but we found out who did it and we went to one of their places in a field, a stone, where they were worshipping. And we prayed over that stone and broke the power over that stone. And they contacted us and said to us, you've destroyed the power in this stone. We will leave your churches alone if you leave our stones alone. I said, it's a long story, which I'm not going to go into, but it just shows the power of Jesus Christ. They could not do anything to me. But these spiritual forces are real. He says, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit in their works and the sons of disobedience. He's talking about the prince of this unseen kingdom of darkness. This prince is personal. He tempts us to sin. He's a liar. He deceives people about God and Christ. He's a murderer, Jesus called him. He's like a roaring, hungry lion, seeking people whom he can devour, Peter says. And the phrase, the spirit is impersonal, it doesn't mean that everybody who is not a Christian is possessed by a demon or Satan. No, it's just talking about that he's created an atmosphere in this world where people no longer care about their creator, God. But God is breaking through this deception, through the gospel of Jesus Christ, and making himself known through the preaching of the gospel as his Holy Spirit enlightens people, bringing them alive to Christ like the Ephesian Christians who were once dead, once enslaved, but no longer. The passions of our flesh and our minds, the Apostle said to the Ephesians, that they were once enslaved by them, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. There is nothing wrong with natural bodily desires. Nothing wrong with food, sleep, sex. God has made the human body that way. But the appetite for food can become gluttony. The need for sleep can become sloth. The desire for sex can turn into uncontrollable lust. All natural desires and needs that are turned into sinful desires. We can have wrong desires of the mind, intellectual pride, false ambition, rejection of known truth, malicious or vengeful thoughts. Before Christ set us free, we were slaves to oppressive influences, both within and without. Outside of us, outside of us the world. Inside of us, a fallen, twisted self-centeredness that didn't care about God. And beyond both of these, a personal devil at work with an army of demonic forces who held us in captivity to the atmosphere he has made in this world of darkness. And so that's why the Apostle Paul writes to them that they were sons of disobedience. He called them sons of disobedience because they had trespassed and sinned against God knowingly and voluntarily and so were condemned. And they were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. They were by nature fallen, they had gone askew, and Jesus has said, you must be born again. And when he uses the term children of wrath, God's wrath is not a bad temper. He's not like a human being that he might fly off the handle at any moment. It's not spite, nor malice, nor animosity, nor revenge. It's a divine reaction to evil that God cannot change. And when evil happens, his wrath is a response to that. It's a bit like a moth flying into the flames of a fire. The moth will be burnt up. God cannot and does not change. And that's the dilemma, because human beings are incompatible 
to live in his presence. So what did God do? He found a way to change them, to change their nature, to bring them alive to him through Jesus Christ. God's wrath is predictable. It's uncompromising. He is hostile to that which destroys his creation. Yet this passage talks about the great love of God as well. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, but they were under wrath, but that by grace they have been saved. Outside of Christ, the Ephesians have been spiritually dead because of trespass and sin, enslaved by the world, the devil, and the passions of their flesh, and therefore condemned under the wrath of God. But through Jesus Christ, the gospel had been preached to them by the Apostle Paul. And through Jesus Christ, God offered them and offers all people today life to the dead, freedom to the enslaved, and grace to the condemned. Let's just remind ourselves what Paul wrote. But God, who is rich in mercy, see, God is rich in mercy. Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. So God loved us, even in that fallen condition, and that is why he sent Jesus Christ, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So despite being the objects of his wrath, because God cannot compromise with evil, he still loved them with a great love. He was rich in mercy and still is because of that great love. That's why the Apostle Paul says, by grace you have been saved. This is the kindness shown to us in Jesus Christ. By God's love, mercy, his grace and his kindness. When we receive Jesus as our Saviour and our Lord, God shows us his love, his mercy, his grace and his kindness. That's why we as Christians do say we have been saved and it is not our doing. It is not by our works. You cannot earn your way to heaven. Jesus is the only way and door. It's God's gracious gift. It's the work and gift of God and it's available to all and that's why we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That God wants to show mercy, he wants to show grace, he wants to show kindness, he wants to express his love to fallen human beings and that is exactly why he sent Jesus Christ and that's why the Apostle Paul is writing to these Ephesian Christians in the past tense that these things you once were once you were enslaved to the world, to the devil, to the passions of your flesh, but now you have been saved by grace through faith. This is for all of those who receive Jesus. They can experience his love, his mercy, his grace, and his kindness. True born again Christians are people who have been saved and remain forever saved. What God did for Jesus, he does for the Christian, which is called the resurrection the ascension and the session. There are three terms of what happened. Jesus was raised from the dead. When we were dead in trespass and sins and we turn to Jesus, he makes us alive together with Christ. We are born again, is the language that Jesus used. Jesus, after rising from the dead and appearing to his disciples, after 40 days, he ascended to heaven. The apostle says that we too have been ascended to heaven in the spiritual sense, that he has made us sit together in the heavenly places 
in Christ Jesus. And the session is a term for when Jesus sat down at the right hand of God. And in verse 6, the Apostle Paul says that he has raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. If we are seated with Christ, we are seated on thrones with him, spiritually speaking, in the unseen world of spiritual reality. Yes, we are the sons and daughters of God as Christians. We may not look like it. The world certainly doesn't recognize us at this time. When we walk down the street, people do not look at us and say, there goes a son or a daughter of God, because we have this treasure within jars of clay, these physical bodies. And one day when these physical bodies wear out and they die, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The Bible says, and Romans 8, 19 says, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. So even the creation is waiting for that day when the sons and daughters of God will be revealed. God did for us what he did for Jesus when we come to him. He raises us from the dead we become born again. As Jesus ascended, we are ascending to spiritual places. We live in the heavenly realms, in our spirits. And we are seated with Christ in places of power and authority, which is why we have power over evil spirits and demonic beings. That's why they couldn't hurt me at that time when I told you about the horrible dream I had when some people were doing this abominable practice of whatever it is they are doing. I have seen and performed exorcisms in the name of Jesus Christ and I know the power that I have in Jesus Christ because as a son of God, I'm alive to him. I am born again. I have a position of authority with Jesus in the heavenly realms and so do you if you are a Christian. Learn who you are in Christ. Receive the identity God says about you, not the identity the world gives to you, but that which God speaks about you in his word. This is not doctrinal dogma. This is lived experience. Living the born again life is a Christian experience. And St. Paul was saying to the Ephesians, by grace you are people who have been saved, because through faith you can see what God has done. It's an act of grace where God forgives our sins, past, present and future, for what Jesus did on the cross. And it's faith that he gives to us as a gift that enables us to see and understand what he has done. And faith comes through hearing the word of God, that as we hear, we believe, we receive, and we walk in the truth that God has revealed through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So even faith is God's gift to us. It's not our own achievement, it's not our own doing, it's not a reward for any of our good deeds. Grace is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So we are saved by God's grace where he forgives and cancels our sins and our trespasses and makes us alive through Jesus Christ. It's not through any works we do, it's his gift. And even faith is the gift he gives to us so that we can understand what he has done. As the fact you are saved is not your achievement, it's God's. Dead people cannot bring themselves to life again. Captive people cannot free themselves. Deceived people cannot know they're deceived unless they are shown the truth by somebody. And this is exactly why Jesus came, to destroy the works of the evil one, to bring new life for those who would receive him, to set free the captives, and to make known the truth, because it is, it is the truth, Jesus said, that sets us free. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, 
which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are not saved because of good works. We were created and made alive in Christ to do good works. God prepared them beforehand for us to do. And so we who once walked in trespass and sin, we now walk in good works. We do not serve the devil, we serve Christ. We do not serve the world, we serve Christ. We do not live purposely a life of sin. Yes, we will make mistakes. The Apostle John says, if anybody says they do not sin, they deceive themselves and the truth of God is not in them. But when we make mistakes, we put it right with God because of what Jesus has done on the cross. As a result, we are no longer children of wrath. The Christian is a child of grace because they have experienced the richness of God's mercy. They understand the amount of his great love for us, the kindness he shows to us, and the grace he gives to us. Know who you are. Recognize the grace God offers through Jesus Christ. Amen. God loved the world so that he gave his only son the lost to save that all who would in him believe should everlasting life receive Christ Jesus is the ground of faith who was made flesh and suffered death all then who trust in him alone are built on this chief cornerstone God would not have the sinner die his son with saving grace is nigh his spirit in the word declares how we in Christ are heaven's heirs be of good cheer for God's own Son forgives all sins which you have done and justified by Jesus' blood your baptism grants the highest good If you are sick if death is near this truth your troubled heart can cheer Christ Jesus saves your soul from death that is the firmest ground of faith glory to God the Father Son now and eternally. Would you like to say together with me the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Amen, Amen, and Amen.